fragile state, a partisan press, and a social media demagogue, Iraq's Muqtada al-Sadr shows the impact of his messaging. The Israeli military admits they probably killed journalist Shirin Abu Akhla. And from outer space to your screen, satellite images in the news. Hello, I'm Meenakshi Ravi, and this is The Listening Post, where we cover global events through the prism of the media. In what's been a year of mounting crises in Iraq, the night of August 29th was a terrifying flashpoint. Violence in Baghdad between rival political factions brought back anxieties about a possible civil war in the country. At the heart of this, months of struggle to form a government. A key player is influential cleric and politician Muqtada al-Sadr. His party won the most seats in last year's election, but the fractured nature of Iraqi politics prevented his coalition from taking power. Al-Sadr is a big figure in Iraq. He has a fiercely loyal base that he massages and manages through a clever communication strategy that spans sermons to social media. For Iraqis who have endured more than two decades of overlapping disasters, faith in their dysfunctional democracy is vanishing. This latest crisis has marked yet another instance where a deeply partisan political sphere, one that is reflected across other institutions, the judiciary, security services, and the media, has brought the country dangerously close to calamity. Our starting point this week is Baghdad. It isn't easy to get your head around what's happening in Iraq right now. Fighting between rival factions left at least 30 people It's the worst fighting the capital has seen in years. International news coverage is episodic. It tracks every conflagration. The explosions follow a day of deadly clashes in the Iraqi capital after Shiite cleric Muqtada al-Sadr said he was leaving politics. However, there's minimal coverage of the simmering tensions in between big events, so it can be tough to connect the dots. And in Iraq, much of the journalism is sectarian and rife with granular and often conflicting details that obscure the big picture. Many times, satire can cut through where journalism cannot. And now, as Iraq counts its 10th month without a formal government, memes and dark humor online give a glimpse of just how Iraqis see the situation in their country. Iraqis, you know, for, for, for all that they've been through, for decades and decades of conflict, one thing they, they certainly have is a sense of humor. And yeah, you see a lot of these memes, right? So we're talking about a massive crisis where the political system is on the brink and people are suffering every day and yet they, they do still have the ability to poke fun. Especially at someone like Muqtad al-Sadr. Who is Muqtad al-Sadr? What is the Sadrist movement? Can anyone make sense? of the leader and the movement. He is the leader of a religious movement, and it's one of the largest Shi Islamist movements in, in the region. And it's primarily made up of poor, urban Iraqis. Again, this is a movement that's run by clerics, it's run by religious leaders, but he sees himself as potentially a bridge from the religious to the politics. There is much mockery of Muqtada Sadr for his constant flip-flopping on issues um, people misspell the word El Sayyid, which means the sir, like the one with the black turban, the descendant of Prophet Muhammad, and they would mistype it as a form of mockery. And when you see that spelling, you know they're talking about Muqtada Sadr of all people. And uh, so it's always used in sarcastic tones. This man's supporters are different from any other party's supporters in Iraq. They are deeply ideological and are ready to become martyrs for Muqtada al-Sadr. When he resigned last week, spontaneous anger erupted among his followers. And honestly, we've seen how there's no control over the Sadrists. There was fear of a complete and utter fall of the state or a descent into an internal war, a civil war, between armed Shia groups. The night of violence on the 29th of August that al-Sadr triggered when he tweeted what he called his final resignation from politics was a show of force. An indication of his anger at having his efforts to form a government thwarted despite his movement winning big in last year's elections. 
the face-off between Al Sadr and opposing politicians has been one of the most serious periods of paralysis in a political system that has been deeply dysfunctional for the nearly two decades since the US invasion of Iraq. Eventually, the riots by the Sadrists were subdued by their leader. We know Muqtada Sadr has influence over a large number of people. It was proven by the effect on the streets after his speech. The armed men and protesters withdrew and the violence was over. There is a certain aspect of Muqtada Sadr's communication with his followers that's distinct, and that's in his use of social media. There are a number of accounts that are officially in Al-Sadr's name, and then there are others disguised with other names or run by loyalists. He uses these different accounts and platforms to mobilize or mislead when needed. So when you listen to Muqtada Sadr um, in video interviews or in any mobile recordings of him talking with his peers, he doesn't sound very eloquent. However, on social media, everything's written so he sounds very different. And there are many references to uh, verses from the Quran and Islamic tradition. And he uses that to legitimize his leadership. Political legitimacy is a scarce commodity in Iraq. Since the end of Saddam Hussein's dictatorship and the invasion by the United States in 2003, governments have come and gone, five of them. But the fortunes of Iraqis have only worsened Public services are in tatters. The economy is as broken as the country's politics. And the proliferation of militias has evaporated the possibility of security and stability for citizens. Democracy hangs by a tenuous thread, with Iraqis deeply mistrustful of all its institutions. The judiciary, the security services, the media. The purpose of the media is that it's an important tool to hold to account the political system and the leaders. What's happened instead is the elites have captured the media and they're now using it for their own purposes, right? Most of the TV channels, the mainstream TV channels, are linked to one or the other political parties, which really means that the media has become uh, a space for political competition. And I think it's one of the biggest reasons why Iraq is not yet a democracy. There's no accountability to the elite through independent media. Some people may flip through TV and watch it, but they will not go to it for objective news. So more people are going online for their news. And there are both positives and negatives to this, ups and downs. On one hand, you're getting news that may not be covered in traditional media outlets. On the other hand, how do you weed through all the misinformation and how do you determine what is disinformation? Electronic armies, hate speech and fake news are the weapons political parties use to mislead public opinion, to smear the opposition and promote their candidates. So I think we have a responsibility as civil society to make sure people are alert about what they read on social media and that they are able to scrutinize it, not simply to accept it at face value. This is where the networks of young Iraqis, tech literate, media literate, and politically engaged come into play. Across the country and even amongst the diaspora, groups like the Iraqi Network for Social Media are sifting through material online, verifying and debunking as they go. Another group, Tech for Peace, works extensively with images, footage, and audio to identify what's real and what's a deep fake. What these groups find much more challenging to counter online is abuse and threats to life. Most recently, those who shared some of the memes about Maqtada al-Sadr have had his loyalists come after them, first over social media and then in person. These kinds of threats are not new. Iraqi politicians, activists and journalists have dealt with it offline for years, and they struggle with it online as well, in a country where freedom of speech is in serious jeopardy. Today, the situation with regards to freedom of press is fragile. In Iraq, you cannot criticize any of the heads that wear the crown. You cannot cross the red lines. 
The weakness of our governments has meant that the political parties and militias and armed factions are stronger than the state. And therefore, it is not the government which decides the limits of freedom of expression, but these random groups. And if you value your life, it's better that you avoid engaging in harsh criticism of any political actor. Four months since the killing of Al Jazeera journalist Shirin Abu Akleh, the Israeli military has finally admitted that it was, quote, highly possible an Israeli soldier shot her. Tarek Nafa has been tracking the case. Mina, this is really just a confirmation of what Palestinian eyewitnesses were saying from the start, that Shirin Abu Akleh was shot dead by an Israeli soldier while doing her job. A number of media investigations by CNN, the Associated Press and the New York Times have all reached the same conclusion. What the Israeli army's report doesn't do is take responsibility for the killing. Abu Akleh's family said war criminals cannot investigate their own crimes. The Jerusalem-based rights group Beit Salem called it a whitewash. No charges will be filed against the soldiers who opened fire on Abu Akla. It's worth reviewing just how many times Israeli authorities have changed their narrative on the killing. Initially, as is often the case, the perpetrators were said to be Palestinian. The next day, the tactic shifted to deflection, condemning accusations against Israel. Without any concrete evidence, hasty accusations against Israel that are being made right now are misleading and irresponsible. Later, the story changed again. The government admitted that Abu Akla may have in fact been killed by an Israeli soldier. It said was aiming at a gunman nearby. On July 4th, a U.S. investigation found that Abu Akla was indeed killed by an Israeli soldier, but that there was no evidence she was deliberately targeted. That line was adopted by the Israeli military. The assertion that Abu Akla's death was just a mistake is difficult to believe. The Israeli military operates an open-fire policy in the territory it occupies. This allows soldiers to use lethal force with impunity. Israel's Prime Minister dismissed a recent call by the US to change Israel's open fire policy, saying the military never deliberately shoots innocent people. More than 140 Palestinians have been killed by Israeli forces since the start of the year. Thanks, Tarek. From Ukraine to Afghanistan to Xinjiang and China, satellite imaging has increasingly become a central part of how conflicts and human rights abuses are uncovered, tracked, and reported. It has empowered journalists and researchers to conduct vital investigations and debunk misinformation in real time, all without risking lives on the ground. Satellite imaging is a booming industry, with shares in the biggest geospatial imaging companies like Maxar, Black Sky, and Planet Labs spiking with the onset of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. But as with any emerging technology, there's an important backstory, and in this case, an implicit bias. American and other Western governments are the primary clients of these companies, which means they have a say over where in the world they can and cannot take pictures. The listening posts Ahmed Mahdi on the bigger picture and the finer details of the satellite companies bringing on the ground news coverage from space. From the buildup of forces along the border. The Russian military convoy getting closer to Russian Kiev troops the near the Ukraine border in to the outbreak of war. It's interesting to see if the Russians move up from the south. To allegations of human rights abuses and war crimes. Bodies lying in the streets before Russian troops withdrew. The civilian bodies were left lying dead for weeks. Audiences around the world have seen the Russia-Ukraine conflict unfold almost in real time. Not from the ground, but from space satellite imagery firstly provides a different angle you're looking at it from above so you're seeing something very different to what you would see from street level or from uh, a human height but more importantly you're gathering data over such a large area that would just not be practically possible for uh, a traditional journalist uh, enables you to or have access to imagery that is taken perhaps every day or every week of everywhere on earth and that is hugely powerful for telling stories. Satellite imagery has been used historically to document a variety of um, atrocities and human rights abuses. 
We saw an important example of this when Secretary of State Madeleine Albright released satellite images of alleged mass graves during the war in Bosnia. There was the UN Security Council presentation by Colin Powell before the U.S. went to war against Iraq and the use of satellite images of alleged weapons of mass destruction. And there were all kinds of controversies, of course, uh, related to that. So this is not a new practice, but because we're seeing so many news media outlets use these images now, it there's a, seems to be a novelty associated with it. One of the companies that has benefited the most from that novelty is US-based satellite company, Maxar Technologies. The American satellite intelligence company Maxar. Maxar satellite images. These images, which were produced by Maxar Technology on the 19th of March. Whether it's natural disasters, mass demonstrations, or collaborating with the BBC on an investigation into human rights abuses in Cameroon, Maxar have led the way in introducing the satellite image to the news media. That all came in handy when the Ukraine war broke out and the company was poised to take advantage of the media interest. Maxar has become a stock turnaround story. It's up some 175% over the past year. Maxar has somewhat become a household name. An earlier image from Maxar Technologies shows one of those same Russian ships. In, a in the past, much of the imagery that they provided was done on a fairly ad hoc basis, but in recent years, they actually formalized their news bureau to more uh, coherently share not only imagery, but in-depth analytics uh, with the news media. Yeah, that is all pro bono work for them. There is no revenue model around working with the media. The earth observation industry in general, whether you're talking about Maxar here in the US, Airbus uh, in France and Europe, and ImageSat International in Israel generates about 80% of its revenues from government, defense, and intelligence customers. Most of the world's major satellite companies actually began life in the military and intelligence services. It wasn't too long ago that satellite imaging was the sole preserve of states. Under the Cold War thawed, many began to offload the huge expense and financial risk of operating these satellites to the private sector. In the US, for example, President Bill Clinton passed a law in the early 90s opening up the use of satellite imaging to private industry. And out of that comes many of today's top geospatial imaging companies. Names like Planet Logic, Black Sky, and of course, Maxar. And to this day, the apple hasn't fallen far from the tree. The Department of Defense and Intelligence Agencies in the United States, they're the primary contractors and they get up to 80% of their satellite image data from these private companies. The federal government has also subsidized a lot of the development of these satellites. They're in, they, they are hand in glove, in a sense. In the case of a situation like uh, the Russia-Ukraine conflict, uh, it's pretty common to see uh, Russian troop movements, but you know I have yet to seen a single image of Ukrainian troop movements. Now that, is that a uh, conscious decision on the part of these companies to withhold that, or is there a government requirement to withhold what could be damaging you know, tactical information on U.S. allies? And it's probably a combination of the both. We need to always be asking, every time we see a satellite image in the news, what is being shown? What does the caption say? Who put the arrows and the circles into the graphic field of that image and what is being argued on the basis of that image. Who generated the satellite image? The answer is, whoever has the money. Here's how it works. Firstly, you have to launch the satellite into space and then you have to position it over where in the world you want to image. That's called tasking and it's expensive, very expensive something only the seriously big players like governments and mega corporations can afford. But once the satellite is in position, the market opens up and some of the images it takes can be bought and sold for a more reasonable price or even shared for free. And that's helped open source journalists, people who investigate stories based on publicly available data to take advantage of satellite imagery to power their reporting. So thinking back to January this year, there were all of these reports in the media about Russia building up troops on the border with Ukraine. So we speculated that 
If an invasion was imminent, these troops would assemble in smaller staging areas closer to the border. In order to work out whether this was happening, I created maps or images, let's say, of data taken from a European Space Agency satellite. Their data is generally all freely available. However, this imagery was in very low resolution. All I could see was effectively just a series of blobs. Then what uh, we went ahead and did was order uh, high resolution imagery of that location that was suspicious. And it turned out that in fact, yes, there was a Russian base uh, that was being built up relatively closer to the border with Ukraine. At the same time, there were many other people who were tracking TikTok posts of very much similar things. And it all just sort of builds together and forms a more concrete proof of what is going on. As far as the news media is concerned, satellite imagery is still an emerging technology. And like most new tech, drones, social media, the internet, it can often hide an implicit bias, illuminating our view of some stories whilst quietly diverting our attention away from others. And its origins as a means of state-sponsored surveillance should really make us ask questions, not only about what the satellite sees, but what it overlooks. Satellite imagery is often classified as a surveillance technology. I think that is a misconception. Just because it so happened that uh, it was first born out of uh, the military industrial complex doesn't necessarily mean that it can't have massive positive impacts across a whole number of fields, whether it's predicting or monitoring the impact of droughts and climate change, whether it's monitoring infrastructure for damage and very quickly responding, whether it's a disaster response. Uh, th there are many, many different kinds of applications outside of defense. And I think what we're seeing right now is that there's uh, a growing recognition of this. It's being integrated more and more into our news media landscape and it is having impacts on us as consumers, as citizens. It, it, it can involve us in a sense of having the power to patrol and monitor events across the planet. And the satellite has an aesthetic that makes us feel like we can see and know anything at the push of a button. And it's just, that's not a reality. It's really important that we have journalists and the public trained to use and read satellite images and to be able to have critical media literacy around them. And finally, to Pakistan, which after a tumultuous year, politically and economically, is now drowning, quite literally, in a crisis bigger than any that have come before. After two weeks of torrential monsoon rainfall and glacial melt, an entire third of the country is now underwater. Balochistan, the largest region of the country, is almost entirely damaged. At last count, at least 1,200 Pakistanis have died in these floods. If you want to understand why the floods have been so devastating this year, you should check out The Third Poll, a website focused on producing journalism about a specific region of the world called the Himalayan watershed. The state of the rivers and glaciers in this mountainous region have a direct impact on multiple countries, including Pakistan. And the third poll's specialist coverage, which is published in five languages, is on point right now. Inside Pakistan, Dawn, the country's oldest English language newspaper, has a dedicated flood emergency section on its website, which provides daily updates and analysis. While the floods are the latest crisis to hit Pakistan, there's also lots happening in the arenas of politics and society. Two podcasts that cover a range of topics are The Pakistan Pivot. Today we're going to be talking about energy crisis, about uh, climate change and particularly under the thematic. And The Pakistan Experience by stand-up comedian and content creator Shehzad Ghiaz Sheikh. Today I have a very special guest, actor, stand-up comic, the host and creator of this podcast. If you prefer to watch what you're listening to, you can find YouTube versions of his podcast too. On Twitter, check out environmental journalist Afia Salam and Myra Hayat, an assistant professor at the University of Notre Dame, who researches water and land theft. There's also Huma Yusuf, a Pakistani columnist who also hosts Climate Mahal, a podcast on climate change and Pakistan. We'll be keeping our eye on developments, especially in the media in Pakistan, and we'll see you next time here at The Listening Post.